few African American men in this country who haven't had the experience of being followed when they were shopping in a department store. That includes me. There are very, very few African American men who haven't had the experience of walking across the street and hearing uh, the locks click on the doors of cars. That happens to me, at least before I was a senator. There are very few African Americans who haven't had the experience of getting on an elevator and a woman clutching her purse uh, nervously uh, and holding her breath until she had a chance to get off. That happens often. All right. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm going to get all choked up when I hear the president. Welcome back to the Steve Molsberg Show. It has been way too long uh, since I have last uh, talked with our next guest. Uh, you read her. She is um, a columnist, syndicated columnist. Uh, she's a correspondent for Dispatch International. She blogs at dianawest.com. And she's a best-selling author. Her latest, American Betrayal, The Secret Assault on Our Nation's Character. Uh, we welcome in Diana West. Hey, Diana, how are you? I'm just fine, Steve. It's so great to be talking to you again. Well, thank you. Uh, the pleasure is mine. I, I played Obama because, I mean, I know the book uh, uh, goes back and uh, the book deals with past presidents and, 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 and takes a look at, um, at Cold War and the different things. But uh, you talk about uh, American betrayal and you talk about the assault on our nation's character. The problem with Obama or the differentiation between your book title and Obama is it, there's nothing secretive about it when, when Obama does it. He's in your face, and he's assaulted our character um, from day one and, and even before he was elected. Well, that's so true. I mean, frankly, but there is, there is something that I would tie into that's not secret. I mean, we've all been around the block so many times now. Very few things are secret. But what he is doing is he's putting over a big lie, and this is essentially what my book is about. He is trying to make white America or non-black America and black America believe that anybody clutching their purse or worrying about being on a dark street and seeing young black men has no rational reason to fear black crime. And if we look at statistics and we talk to our neighbors and anyone who's lived in certain urban environments knows it is a real threat. And that so for survival's sake, yes, there is a, an instinct there that appreciates the reality. This is what I'm looking back in time at, leaders repeatedly teaching the American people big lies about reality, whether it's about communism, whether it's about Islam after 9-11, or here we have a race myth being perpetuated to try to essentially undermine our own um, logic and our own morality. And, and it, it's, it's very evil when you see it perpetrated from the top. Yeah, no, a a absolutely, absolutely. And what's happened to our Justice Department uh, we just had Jay Christian Adams on, yeah, and of I course, you know, I mean, it, it, we the, the fact that how can I the fact that our leadership or Republican leadership, conservative leadership, uh, elected leadership isn't out there talking about this and 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 saying, hey, you know, there's if if, if the Justice Department goes after George Zimmerman, it's an injustice. He's been tried. They invest. I mean, there's nothing. There's nothing. I mean, you hear nothing from Boehner. You hear nothing from McConnell. We have no leadership. Uh, they're afraid to defund Obamacare. I mean, it just goes on and on and on. It's such a bitter disappointment. Well, it is. And again, I think that there are, you know, again, going back to the book, it just, I guess when you write a book, you start seeing everything. Absolutely. In, in that perspective. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, the, the practical applications. And what I would say here is that, that in this mythology, in this big lie that President Obama is putting over, you see classic uh, Marxist tactics of dividing, dividing the people according to class slash race, pitting groups against each other. And the reasons behind that are clearly to sow discord and to enable the central state to seize certain kinds of powers, to, in the cases of rioting, to move in in, 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 in force. This is the kind of disunion, disharmony that, that demagogues and totalitarians throughout history have sought to create. And it does go back to, we, you know, in the modern parlance, we talk about Alinsky tactics, but Alinsky tactics are actually derived straight from Marx, straight from Lenin, right, right out of the, the collectivist totalitarian handbook. And that's what's so frightening when you see it applied in America. And, and right, and Diana, what, what got me is, you know, when you talk about in your book uh, the Soviet uh, influence in this country, how they were able, they put themselves in place, how they were able to entrench themselves and to be able to take advantage 
of the uh, the communists in this country and 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 organize them and 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 propel them to the extent that they were propelled not too too far thank god but um you know what i think of now i think of the muslim brotherhood and the offshoots with different names of the muslim brotherhood uh that are entrenched in our government in every major department of our government right now well, that is exactly what set me off into this sort of excursion through our past. I actually did not set out to write the book that I spent the last several years writing. It was kind of the logic of the research that took me here. What I began with was, frankly, I, as you mentioned, I write a weekly syndicated newspaper column. And, of course, like the rest of America after 9-11, had started to be, study Islam and jihad and these new concepts that came to us, came to our shores on 9-11. And so we get hit on 9-11, President Bush comes out and says, Islam is a religion of peace. And lo and behold, the next decade, what I observe as a working reporter is that every fact that is permissible in public discourse, and by that I would mean by politicians, by pundits, by people who get on a lot of TV and mainstream media, has to support that completely illogical statement. No logic to it. I realized at a certain point it's an ideological statement, and I decided to set out to understand how could we get to a place where we are no longer collect, connecting facts and conclusions and making sort of very standard logical sta uh, conclusions anymore. And I've learned that as we talk about, say, Islamophobes today, which is what someone gets called if you step outside this box, in yesteryear, we had red baiters. Right. Red baiting was the word that used to stop debate and investigation of communist infiltration, of communist conspiracy in our government, as you allude to. Islamophobe is the word today. And yes, there are parallels between what we see as Muslim Brotherhood penetration, Saudi showers of Saudi monies into our, 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 our media, including Fox News, into our campuses from Harvard to Georgetown and Muslim Brotherhood outreach, outreach to Islamic groups that our government has actually identified as Muslim Brotherhood front groups, you go back in time and you realize during World War II in particular, the federal government, President Roosevelt, whitewashed communism, just as we have Bush and Obama whitewashing Islam. You had Uncle Joe Stalin. Do you remember that horrible nickname for Joseph Stalin, one of the great mass murderers of all time? Absolutely. He was presented to the American people as a great guy along with communism, which was something that could be compatible with democracy. Does this sound familiar? Well, you, let's, let's look at, uh, at, at, Joe, at Senator McCarthy. Right. And, 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 you know, McCarthyism, quote-unquote. Sure. And by the way, uh, you'll be interested in this, Diana, as uh, most of America will. Uh, Anthony Weiner's holding a press conference at 5 o'clock. Now, this mm -hmm. idiot... This this idiot said months ago, before he ever said he was running, to uh, to uh, Dominic Carter. We we have the tape. We played it. We have it right here again to play later. Uh, that yeah, there could be more pictures out there, more things out there. But you know, I'm not getting into that. And yet they did the Times cover story on him, Diana, and everything yeah. was. Uma, 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 who I want to bring up in a second, so it, it does fit. Okay. Uma, Uma, Uma. It's all about my wife. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. And so I said, well, why would he run again then? Why doesn't he stay in his hole when he's saying more pictures will come out if he runs? It'll only upset his wife again. Well, I don't know if he's going to resign today or if he's going to just say, I told you there'd be more pictures. But we'll see. I mean, resign from the uh, thing. But Uma, that, uh, that's why I, I, I digress to, uh, to him sure. about the 5 o'clock press conference. Um, you know, the, the closest we have here is Michelle Bachman and five, four other members of Congress wrote a letter to the State Department, Justice Department, whatever, and said, you know, we really need to investigate the connections, the ties to Uma Abedin, who has top security clearance as Hillary Clinton's assistant for the last 15 years. Uh, her mother, her father, her relatives have mother, Muslim Brotherhood connections, uh, et cetera. And John McCain took to the floor and said, "Why this is in America? What are you doing? Yeah. And and I, 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 at that time, I thought, they're treating her and, and the other four like, you know, like they're McCarthy. Right. Well, it's, it's kind of like, uh, you know, uh, calumny upon calumny. Here we have, yes, Michelle Bachman and the four other congressmen attempting to simply ask for inspectors general to look at, actually, it was a litany of very un uh, alarming instances of apparent influence by these groups on our policymaking chain. And yes, Huma Abedin was certainly one of them as the top assistant to the Secretary of State. 
How does she get clearance when it's not just even the Muslim Brotherhood connections in her family? She, too, participated in the family business, which was funded. It was a, it's an institute called Muslim, Institute of Muslim Minority Affairs in Saudi Arabia. It puts out a journal. It was bankrolled by a man that the United States de- designated an al-Qaeda financier, a man by the name of Abdullah Omar Nassif, whom Huma actually sat on a board with for years. And this man founded Rabbit a Trust, which after 9-11 was designated a foreign terrorist organization. How does someone with – there's no degree of separation here. No, no, but you, you, are, you, are an, you are an Islamophobe, aren't you, Diana? <laughs> yes, but I would like to draw a, a connection because if we go back in time to Secretary of State Edward Statinius, his top aide at the time, of a, at, a very, at a very crucial time in American history, was Alger Hiss, a straight-up – Soviet agent working for Soviet military intelligence, we now know. So you see these parallels are not out of whole cloth. They exist. They need to be run down. This needs to be discussed, faced, confronted. And, in, and then the twist on it is to call it McCarthyism is to do injustice to one of the great investigators, Senator McCarthy, who's actually trying to understand, were there communists in sensitive positions in our federal government? That is what he was trying to investigate, along with Rep- uh, Senator Pat McCarran, a Democrat, along with uh, Representative Martin Dyes, another Democrat in the House, trying to understand the extent to which, under the Roosevelt administration, scores of American traders had entered into sensitive positions in our federal government, hundreds in positions of power. And they were trying to kind of clean up the mess. And where I get to this notion of American betrayal is that what you see the federal government doing when these investigators, you know, trying to figure out what happened, they are smeared and slammed, just like Michelle Bachman was, simply for trying to find out, was our constitutional republic at risk? And I think that's the crux of this whole issue. And the longer we suppress that and not connect what we know, what's been confirmed by releases from Soviet archives and so on about the identities of these traders, we can never really understand the problem of penetration and influence and deception and disinformation that happens inside our open society. No, I, I, so I, I, we're seeing it today. I, right, and I know that wasn't a that that wasn't a, uh, a wiener joke you were trying to make there. We're talking to uh, you used the word I won't repeat it. We're working to oh. we're, we're talking to Diana West. No, it wasn't. I know, but you can't help it. Everything you say is a wiener Everything joke. Is. Every <laughs> single word. We're talking to Diana West. Uh, her her latest American betrayal: the secret assault on our nation's character. One more for you. You know, back then we had a very limited media, certainly. If you go back far enough, we had radio only, then we had television, then we had the three networks eventually, and that was it. Now, right, right, of course. Uh, Now we have a whole new world, uh, but a saturation of, some might say, uh, people who are just... uh, have inherited maybe from their parents or from their professors or from whatever uh, the, the, the slant and the beliefs that their pro-Soviet uh, you know, ancestors might have had. And they're at the very least, you might say, they're, they're leftists. And at the very worst, you might say that they're you know, Marxists or, or whatever. Um, so how, do, how does that influence in people's lives? Because people who aren't as politically savvy as you and I watch these people and get their facts from them, quote-unquote, or read the New York Times or, and the newspapers. How does that, in, you know, uh, the, the new media, if you will, compared to back then, make what you write about and com- taking it to today, that problem so much worse, being able to decipher the truth from the lies? Well, it, it, yes, I mean, it, it is a very difficult thing because what I find, and this again goes back to sort of a Marxist um, strategy, when words are not permissible, and I'm talking about what we think of as political correctness, but again, this goes right back to Marxism-Leninism where you had these lexicons of what was permissible to discuss and words you couldn't use and so on. When you stop using words like jihad, like Islam, Um, like uh, 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 caliphate, and these are actual words that have been removed from government communications about these very problems, Um, people stop thinking about it. They can't talk about it. They can't conceptualize it. And so when someone comes forward, in this case, like a Michelle Bachman trying to say, hey, there may be some Muslim Brotherhood problems here, it is so out of context that it becomes very easy to isolate her, to smear her, or and to make an example 
of her. In fact, I have talked to people who work in this field in Washington who talk to people at Homeland Security, who talk to people at Justice or FBI and, and, and the Pentagon and so on, who tell me that, yes, people on the inside who know better are afraid because they see certain trainers on, on Islam and Jihad being made examples of, Michelle Bachman being made an example of, and they are they don't want to be made an example of. And so you have sort of a double whammy where we are mentally conditioned, I would say brainwashed, not to think about things in, logical, in, in a logical way and use the actual words like jihad to describe jihad. And people are made, it, taken, um, made examples of, and, and, and for, it's very disturbing and disappointing that human beings are not stronger, but people do react and tend to um, retreat. And so it's very difficult to answer your question. I don't have a happy answer there. Yeah. Well, no, but it's something we all have to deal with. Listen, uh, great luck with the book, uh, Diana, and uh, we'll have you back soon, I promise. Love uh, you. And uh, thank you for, uh, for the time. Thank you, Steve. Great to talk to you. You Bye too. Now.